son, when he did come to earth, did become flesh and, and became a man. But I do agree with the idea of the hypostatic union that you can't divide this human nature and God nature in Jesus Christ, but you know that his experience on earth was one experience that he's not dividing himself constantly between these two natures. And when Jesus Christ is saying, not my will, but thine be done, that he's talking about how the son has a separate will from the father, not just uh, only you know, presented in some fashion of a human distinction between a divine distinction. And we can see that those distinctions... These, she, she says, I do believe with the idea of the hypostatic union. No, you don't. You don't know what the hypostatic union is. He is defining the hypostatic union by monophysitism. The new IFB doctrine and Shelley's doctrine is that what makes the son both God and man simultaneously is that his flesh is divine. <laughs> And that in the flesh, he has God the Father's DNA. He's like some sort of demigod, like the Greek gods were, uh, like Hercules or something like that. You know, the mother's going to give an X no matter what, but if the father gives a Y, now it's going to be a male. How is Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, without a father? He can't be. So who supplied that gender? God did. Because Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. His flesh was divine. His flesh was not just of woman. It was also of God. He's different than you and me. That is not what the hypostatic union is. And this is another perfect example of the new IFB taking classical language and redefining it. it. Just like they do with the Trinity and with persons, he's doing this with the hypostatic union. And he's saying what he thinks is that the classical position of making a distinction between the divine nature and the human nature, he thinks that that's Nestorianism. But he thinks that the classical hypostatic union is Nestorianism. And he thinks that his monophysite view, which was condemned by the councils that came up with the term hypostatic union, is the actual hypostatic union. And he, what he believes is monophysitism. Now, if you go real quickly to the Wikipedia page of the hypostatic union, let's just read real quick. The hypostatic union is a technical term in Christian theology employed in mainstream Christology to describe the union of Christ's humanity and divinity in one hypostasis or individual personhood. In the most basic terms, the concept of hypostatic union states that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. He is simultaneously perfect divine and perfectly human, having two complete and distinct natures at once. The Athanasian Creed recognized this doctrine and affirmed its importance by stating, He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and He is human from the essence of His mother, born in time. So right away, you have a rejection of the new IFB doctrine. Because the new IB doctrine is, of course, that he gets his flesh also from the Father, because the God the Father's DNA is in it. Of course, then how would that be the Son in any meaningful fashion? You end up just teaching some form of modalism, <laughs> because it's really God the Father manifests in the flesh, not the Son. So, of course, as I've stated often, the new IFB are the only people who are so theologically bankrupt that they can somehow find a way of being polytheistic and uh, modalist at the same time. But it's, it goes on to saying here, to citing the Athanasian Creed, born in time, completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh. So he had a rational human soul and flesh. What does that mean? He had a human intellect, which was distinct from his divine intellect, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one, however, not by the divinity being turned into flesh, the way they say it is, but by taking by God's taking humanity to himself. He is one, certainly not by the blending of his essence, but by the unity of this person, by his person. For just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. So he mentioned there that he thinks that the real hypostatic union, making a distinction between the human nature and the divine nature, is somehow uh, separating it. But the hypostatic union says you cannot separate it. They're united in one person. And where we get this from Scripture, by the way, is the following. We have various statements in Scripture that force us to believe the hypostatic union, that Christ is completely human, totally and truly human, and truly divine. Two distinct natures in one person, so that the human is not divine, neither is the divinity human. The divinity is divinity, the human is human, and these are inseparably united in the one person who is God the Son. That is what the Bible teaches, and that is what the hypostatic union teaches. And each one of these natures maintain their properties, meaning the human nature has a human will, and the divine nature has a divine will. That is what Christianity has historically taught. What Shelley is teaching is monophysitism, as we have documented thoroughly on this channel. But 
why we are forced to believe the hypostatic union is, for example, Hebrews 2.14 says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, the same way that we are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through that he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So here we see that Jesus Christ, God the Son, had to take on our flesh and blood. 1 Corinthians 15 also states, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So here it makes it clear that Christ had to be human the same way that Adam was. Not in this halfway human, some type of a mixture between divinity and man. He had to be man the same way that Adam was. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. He is going to be the substitutionary atonement. He is going to take our place as perfect human, as a true human. We also know that Christ is clearly God. The Bible says in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So clearly the word, the Son, is God. And yet it talks about him in these human terms. But it also has statements such as in Acts 20, 28, where it says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and unto all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So here refers to God's blood, right? But of course, we know that God in his nature does not have blood. He is not physical. But what this is showing us is that Christ, being one person, anything that is proper to either one of his natures can be said of the whole person. So the person that is God has blood in his human nature. So from all of these type of texts, we gather that there is an inseparable unity between the human and the divine and the one person that is Christ. So much so that you can say that God had blood because the person that is God has blood in his human nature. It's one person but with two distinct natures. But you cannot say that the divine nature had blood, clearly, because the divine nature is ineffable, the divine nature is infinite and omnipresent and not corporeal, so on and so forth. So from there, we get the idea of the hypostatic union. Now here, we see the Chalcedonian Creed, which is from 451, about 50 or so years after the Athanasian Creed, which that Wikipedia article on the hypostatic union reference. This is when the doctrine of the hypostatic union was further defined here at the Creed of Chalcedon, and this is the Creed, sorry, here at the Council of Chalcedon, and this is the Creed from that Council. It says, We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body. Once again, making that point that he had a reasonable human soul, meaning he had human faculties, human will, consubstantial with us according to the manhood, and all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, meaning you can't say that they're that the divine nature is the human nature. You can't confuse them unchangeably, indivisibly, meaning you can't separate them inseparably. You can't say that the human nature is its own person and the divine nature its own person. The distinction of the natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same son and only begotten God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him. So, clearly, this is not what Shelley believes. He does not believe the hypostatic union. He believes that there is a mixture between the divine and the human, and he believes that when Jesus Christ says, not mine will, but thine be done, that that is his divine will as the Son, somehow, uh, saying to the divine will of the Father, not mine will, but thine be done. There is a disagreement, there's a fracturing in the Godhead, how you avoid polytheism like that, I have no idea. Um, and, and we'll see that the, the Mormons actually agree with him there. But if you look at the Third Council of Constantinople, it says over here, the Third Council of Constantinople, counted as the Sixth Ecumenical Council by the Eastern Orthodox and Catholic Churches, as well as by certain other Western churches, met in 680 and 681 and condemned monoenergism and monothelitism as heretical and defined Jesus Christ as having two energies and two wills, divine and human. This is what the historical understanding of the hypostatic union is, that each one of his natures has its own will proper to itself. He is of a rational human soul, 
but he also has a divine will. So when you see a tension between the son and the father and their wills, it is the human will of the son that is struggling against the father's will. That is divine will, which is the self-same of the father's will because they are one God, one being, one nature. So you cannot just take, uh, like he's done in other cases with the Trinity, with persons, he is now trying to hijack the hypostatic union. Um, and it, of course, what he believes is really monophysitism or Eutychianism. Are even mentioned in John 6 when he talks about his will being different from the Father's when being sent to earth. We can see those distinctions in the fact that Jesus Christ is saying that he had a self apart from the Father before the world was. And so, you know, I believe that God is made up of three persons that have always existed, always will exist, and that these three persons are their own selves, and yet there is still one God. Now, this um, paper that I was referencing isn't really going to reference the Bible or Scripture. It's just kind of referencing philosophy and just the different pros and cons of the one self theory. Yeah, this paper written by Unitarian heretic Dale Tuggy. And of course, Shelley didn't know this, didn't realize this, didn't realize he was taking all the categories from a Unitarian heretic who denies the deity of Christ. But he ate it all up because he'll take anything but Christian categories. 